Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Daily French Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Larimer, and I'm joined today by Mr. Marius Ruiz. Marius, how are you doing? How's Nick? I'm doing, uh, you know, all right, all right for July. Uh, and returning to the podcast after a bit of an absence, uh, he took a job somewhere else, uh, but he has returned to our arms like the prodigal son, and we're very happy to have him back. Mr. Herman Pretorius. Herman, how are you? I'm well. Um, the prodigal son spent a lot of time with whores and swine. <laughs> yes, uh, and I, I'm not surprised then that you saw the need to return to our arms. Um, and we are very, you are yes. very welcome back, sir. So it's very good to have you back. Thank you. Good to be back. Okay, so we had a bunch of by-elections yesterday. Uh, there were some in George uh, on the uh, on the south coast real south coast i don't know why sometimes case <laughs> south of case is called the south coast anyway um we also had some in uh Mangum, Lumpentain. uh this was after a number of anc councils even though the anc controls that majority that that municipality rather uh, with an absolute majority being i think one of the few metros that they do uh there was still a vote against the ANC speaker there because three ANC councillors defected. They were all kicked out of the party. They ran as independents, and as a result, they were by-elections. Um, so, Marius, you know, there was also, I think, some some by-elections in KZN, as they always seem to be, because someone is always retiring killed. or getting killed or something like that. Uh, and, um, Morris, what, what were the trends that we saw on the by-elections yesterday? Well, just on that Kozumir-Tal uh, by-election, there's one in a place called Mutonjanani, which is Malmuth and kind of central Kozumir Natal. And the reason they had to be a by election there is because the sitting ward councillor resigned because they were fearing for their life. So that is quite worrying. Yeah. And it's yeah. not, uh, yeah, it's a bit concerning that that kind of thing's happening. And actually, in that uh, uh, by election, the ANC lost to the IFP. And the IFP actually saw quite a big jump in its support there. Uh, it went from 40 odd percent to uh, 62 percent, so about a 20 percent. 20 percentage point uh, jump and i think it continues this trend we've been seeing in kwazulu natal where with the anc doing pretty badly compared to the ifp i think in the recent times the anc's only won one ward off the ifp in the last couple of months and although that was pretty the, decisive that win right because it got them control of the municipality i know there, there's the one now with Munton Janani. they already had there's a previous by-election where the ifp won uh, a seat of the ANC, yeah, that already gave the majority. Now they've just got a bit more comfortable. Majority. No, I mean, the, I mean, the ANC's victory managed to. Oh, yeah, to get and it but the that. the issue with that though is there's rumours that uh, um, there were people handing out food parcels and so on. If you took a photo of your ballot and showed that you'd voted for the ANC, you got a food parcel. So I mean, that's yeah. not confirmed. There was Velenkozi Khabisa, who's the leader of the IFP, who said uh, claimed that on an interview I watched a little while ago. But I wouldn't be surprised. And it's right, not considering it bucked the trend, TV. right? Because exactly. I think the so, ANC actually went up a little bit in that by-election. Exactly. It's like the first by-election in, in case it ended, they've actually increased a bit. Exactly. Yeah. So there's something fishy there. But the other interesting thing, I think, was the George by-elections, where uh, those were three boards held by people from Good, and it was a very bad day for Good. Uh, they didn't defend any of those wards. They lost each of their each of those three wards. And the PA won one seat, and the DA won the other two. And Good's really got, got a... a Got a hammering on uh, yesterday in the by-elections. You know, it's, uh, it won those wards in 2021. Now it wasn't even second or third; it was fourth in most of them. So it's quite a quite a problem, I think, for good. And I think it shows you maybe this kind of rhetoric saying that a vote for good is actually a vote for the ANC. A lot of people are buying it, and they'd rather vote for the DA or the Patriotic Alliance or whatever the case is. And uh, that also gives the DA now a majority in George. Uh, it was governing coalition with the Freedom Front Plus. I think it'll be quite interesting to see if the DA continues this coalition with the Freedom Front Plus. It's kind of a good faith coalition. To, so according say, to the, like the Daily kind of Maverick, um, they say that uh, the DA or the Freedom Front Plus has, has said to them that the coalition yeah. is likely to continue, um, mm -hmm. despite the fact that the DA now has a majority. Which I think is a good idea for the, uh, if we're looking, you know, kind of moonshot, good faith engagement and so on. I think it's, it'd be quite a good move by the DA to keep the Freedom Front Plus on board, I think. And then, uh, yeah, then the only uh, the other by-election uh, was in Senku, I think that's how you say it, which is Barclay East in the Eastern Cape. And there the ANC managed to defend a, defend a ward pretty easily. But the only uh, opposition they had was from the EFF, 
So I don't think we can read too much into that. But I think overall, it was a very bad day for good. A decent day for the DA and the PA. A middling day for the ANC, I think. Because, I mean, they did pretty well in Mangal. And, and a pretty good day for the IFP, I think. Yeah, just looking at the Mangal uh, results, it looks a little bit to me as though the independents actually probably had a shot in these wards, the former ANC councillors. Um, in, in Ward 7 in Mangalum, which is uh, southeast of the city centre, uh, the the independent, they got 33% of the vote. Um, and then you had the EFF coming in second with 9% of the vote. And the ANC went down from 75% to 54%. So one wonders, though, you know, if you had, if you had, I don't know, maybe had that councillor join the EFF or the DA or something or, or or, or formed some kind of co uh, alliance there, maybe he would have been able to do better with some support from a political party. Uh, the same in Ward 29, also in Mangum, um, where the, the the incumbent independent got 21% of the vote. Mm -hmm. So these are strong ANC wards. It would have been a bit of a long shot to win them. Um, but in that ward, the EFF came second with 17% of the vote. So you wonder once again, maybe the EFF is missing a trick by not trying to recruit these guys. Or maybe they didn't want to be recruited by the EFF considering the EFF comes with, uh, shall we say, baggage. Um, Herman, I think the most, the biggest story out of these uh, is that the good party really is kind of in trouble here. And uh, that makes sense. You know, if you are a voter who wants to vote either for, you know, you kind of, because the target market of good and good and the PA both seems to be kind of colored voters. If you're a colored voter who's not really interested in the ANC, not really interested in the DA, why would you vote for good over the PA? Good's closer to the ANC. Um, it seems to be, yeah. you know, pretty much in, I mean, the, the, the leader is in, is in cabinet, cabinet. Uh, Patricia Delo. Uh, and the PA just seems to be more nimble, yeah. uh, more cunning, uh, better, I don't know, better at campaigning. What's your take on all this? Yeah, so I think essentially a colored voter in the Western Cape can vote for one of four parties. Good, the PA, the DA, or the Freedom Front Plus. Uh, the Freedom Front Plus would be sort of your Peter Marais of the world. So I, I suspect that isn't a massive temptation um, in, in, in the George part of the world. Um, I, it, it, it just doesn't strike me as a feasible option. Um, then you've got Good, who actually didn't do too badly in the previous elections. But now that they have cabinet minister or that they have Patricia Lill in cabinet since the election, it becomes tough to actually argue what the point of good is. Um, colored voters who might actually, you know, consider voting for good could now just vote for the ANC because the votes end up in the same pool rather. Um, so it comes down to a bit of a choice between the DA and the PA. Uh, and what, what I've seen uh, in, in, a, in a few elections is, and, and, and a bit of polling as well, is that the PA is a threat to the DA on a very localized level. On uh, the, the provincial and the national level, you don't actually see the PA damaging the DA too much. But because there's sort of the, the, the idea of colored communities uh, uh, uniting possibly around the attractiveness of a Gate and McKenzie muscular pragmatism, it becomes more tempting to vote for the PA in local elections because good, the Free and Front Plus, don't offer the typical colored community much. The DA offers good governance, but uh, the colored vote generally willing to entertain that at a higher level so at the, at the end of the day so, I'm, so I'm, one of the I, things I, i've PA heard walked away better right one of the things i've heard also about gate mckenzie's strategy in a lot of these by-elections has been to really focus on recruiting solid candidates um yeah. candidates who are well known candidates who are already pretty well established and that has been part of the reason why the pa has been able to do so well in these by-elections is because they've been very um strategic and cunning and good at getting uh, popular candidates. And also unashamedly pushing colored nationalism uh, or, or colored ethnicism. You know, this, this sort of, we, we, um, we had the whites in charge and the coloreds didn't do well out of that. Now we've got the blacks in charge and the coloreds aren't doing well out of it. It's time for us to take control of our own destiny. McKenzie has a very clear sort of uh, uh, tribal politics that he pushes. Um, if you combine that, 
uh, with solid candidates on the ground, you, you do get this idea of your friendly neighborhood PA candidate being something attractive for colored voters in the Western Cape and ironically in large parts of parts of Gauteng uh, or in parts of Gauteng to vote for. Um, but yeah, now I, I, I get a kick out of good doing badly. It really is uh, one of the most annoying parties uh, in existence in South Africa. And it doesn't help that sort of uh, the minister, the, their leader, um, was responsible for keeping people out of South Africa. Then she was so bad at that job, they gave her the job of getting people into South Africa, probably based on her performance in control of the border. Um, and Brett Heron looks like a Bond villain and is, you know, it, it, one, one can have political opposition and political, you know, uh, specific antagonistic relationships. But one really gets the feeling that Brett Heron targets the DA, not to target principled mistakes, but really just to snipe and to be snide. And, and, and it's satisfying to see that that's not rewarded. So, Morris, how much of this do you think we can put down to the fact that good is seen as too close to the ANC? I, I, I suspect that that's a big reason for this. And the PA, I think, has so far been able to dodge that claim. The DA has definitely made that claim about the PA, but I don't think it's stuck. Um, do you think that that's mainly what's causing good's I guess collapse here, at least in these. Yeah, moments. I think that's that's a big part of it. Um, but there's also, I mean, the, I think the PA is definitely going to do better than good in next year's elections. I wouldn't be surprised if good doesn't get back to parliament. Actually, I think they only got two seats in parliament at the moment. So you know, they're definitely going to go backwards. They might retain those two seats. They're not, definitely not going to go up. And I can see the PA getting, you know, definitely get more than a percent of the vote, maybe even two or three, and you know, five, six, maybe even ten percent in the Western Cape, and they'll probably do okay in Gauteng as well. So it's definitely something to watch. It was also always quite ironic when you listen to Brett Heron and Patricia DeLille talking about the DA and how racist it is and all that kind of stuff. When Patricia DeLille was the DA mayor of Cape Town for eight or nine years or whatever it was, and Brett Heron was a member of the mayoral committee, I think. So, you know, they're obviously like in this belly of this terribly racist beast. And then suddenly they saw the light and had to leave, you know. So it's all uh, all quite funny. So, but yeah, but... Uh, the light code uh, sided very closely with a uh, with an investigation into improper awarding of a tent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but uh, just on an issue of uh, coloured voters, coloured voters are probably the only real swing voters in South Africa. I mean, most uh, black voters yeah. outside of KwaZulu Natal vote ANC generally. You know, EFF maybe, and obviously some other. Um, you see some other trends, and in uh, white wards, uh, especially English speaking ones, the DA gets the numbers that you normally see in uh, elections in North Korea. You know. 90% and so on. If you go to C points in Cape Town, you know, the DA is getting 90%, 92%, and the, the biggest opposition party will be the Cape Independence Party. So it's. Uh, but it's. I think that's a very good point you make, Marius. Um, I've been looking into um, some election data, you know, from 1994 uh, to 2021, and there's a 7% block in the Western Cape vote that really shifts easily from. First, the NNP, DA, ID, back to DA, splitting into good Al Jamaa and PA. That sort of 7% block of colored voters really migrating, being pragmatic about uh, what, what their interests might be at the moment. I think that's a very astute observation that the, the colored vote as a general rule, really is, is the swing vote. You're absolutely right. I think that's a point that people You see, and this. this this brings up something I do want to mention here, which is that so obviously we're guilty of it here, but you know, we're talking about the election in racial terms. And I think part of the problem here is that that swing group there, I think if you if you kind of drilled into the data about who those people were, you would find that they all tended to be, I don't know, people who work in a certain kinds of professions or had a certain level of education or something like that. And I think it would be nice in South Africa to have more data. Uh, more polling data that actually breaks up the sort of racial blocks into the actual demographics that people care about. You know, the the sort of things yeah. that really change what makes your uh, your opinion about uh, how you vote in South Africa. I think um, something something that that we have to deal with is is the fact that um, racial politics has become a shorthand for socioeconomic status, um, and coloured voters, as a general rule, are aspirant middle class or lower middle class. So they share 
um, not a racial commonality of coloreds want something different than white people or black people, and you can define the ambitions of people based on you know what the skin color is. Uh, but apartheid and the ANC dispensation in the last 15 years has really had the same socioeconomic effect towards colored communities not being quite quite white enough for their NP. So you weren't you know the the, the I, the antagonism from the NP towards colored people wasn't as hectic um, across the board as it was to, to black South Africans. But then you've got the inverse of that with the ANC. They're not quite black enough. So they've, the, the, the colored vote, the colored demographic is actually surprisingly compressed and narrow in terms of where it falls in, in a sort of a social or economic hierarchy in South Africa. So I think when we talk about the colored vote, um, it, it has, of course, ethnic, historical, components, close-knit communities, but mostly it boils down to these people have been treated by history and policy in a certain way, and that has put them in a relatively narrow socioeconomic bracket. And I'm and, um, sure the ANC's aggressive affirmative action targets, which uh, I think are very fairly seen as being very harsh on colors in particular, um, are, are, are certainly not, uh, are certainly drawing people away, colored voters away from the ANC. Um, Maris, final thoughts? Yeah, I'm trying to say there's obviously no such thing as the colored vote or the white vote or the black vote. But I think there are patterns we can see amongst people who look sort of alike like each other. And it's all, I think, just part of the analysis. But obviously, if you're a black person, it doesn't mean you're going to vote ANC. If you're a white person, not necessarily going to vote DA or whatever the case is. But I think it's just, it can be used as proxies and a, a guide to kind of voting, voting dem demographics and what. And in, in, interestingly enough, um, uh, if, if only on that point, if only black South Africans voted in elections, the EFF and the DA would compete for who'd be the official opposition. Um, right. if, if you look, so, so even even if we take the racial element and we really lean into it, it still doesn't fundamentally throw out the idea of who are the big parties, who are the middle tier, and who are the sort of uh, the, the asterisks in the data. Right. All right. Um, let's move on to our next topic. And this is uh, some comments made by important businessmen in South Africa, which I think is uh, instructive as to the sort of mood of the business community. So the first one I just want to mention briefly is Matthew Sposa, former ANC vet veteran. I don't actually know if he's still a member of the ANC, but uh, he was, well, he said some interesting things. Um, <laughs> Namely, that uh, I think, quote, we've got a bunch of thieves ruling us, <laughs> was his kind of opening line, so not really holding back there. And that uh, he was referring to African um, uh, leaders across the continent in general, but with a specific focus on South Africa, saying uh, that leaders are stealing like hell from taxpayers. Uh, he was very annoyed. He said some things that I profoundly disagree with in this, which is that, you know, he starts off by saying, Nelson Mandela was great, which most people I think can, can can agree on. But then he goes on to say, but you see, uh, there was no real corruption under Tabo and Beki, and it was only after him that all things went wrong. And I think there's some definitely some mistakes in that analysis here. But however, he did uh, make a lot of the fact that uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa has, in his words, been indecisive. And that uh, he said, quote, our president is very indecisive. There's no there's a consensus in this country that you cannot govern by commissions, committees. You must make decisions, and it starts with him to destroy the rot. Don't have questionable things around you. He criticized Ramaphosa for not implementing the Zonda Commission report or doing any real action on that. Um, and at the same time, we had the chairman of Pick and Pay, Gareth Ackerman, one of the rich, also one of the richest people in the country, uh, along with Matthew Sposa, uh, who says that Pick and Pay is expecting a decline of more than... 20% for the first half of 2024, and that it's very difficult to stay positive about the future of South Africa. He said, um, he's, he's also the, the, the co-chair of the Consumer Goods Council of South Africa. He said that government was really dropping the ball when it comes to business with its crazy race-based water rights quotas, which we saw yesterday, uh, which talked about yesterday rather on the show. Um, the Employment Equity Amendment Act with its you know ridiculous racial quotas for every sector of the economy. Uh, pressures on business from load shedding, collapsing infrastructure, a lot of stuff I think that uh, we at the, the IRR would really agree with. Herman, what do you make of these comments by these uh, businessmen? 
we've also seen, I think, comments by Business Leadership SA who have really been sticking into the government recently. And I think the conversation, at least from business side, has gotten far more constructive and far less uh, kind of mealy mouth just trying to cut a deal with the government. There's actually now real genuine criticism about policies and the ideas that are driving us into this mess. I, I mean, it's, it, it's welcome. Uh, the concern is that it might be a bit too late. Um, the, the, I, I'm, I'm particularly tickled by the idea that there was no corruption uh, under Mbeki, um, that Matthews Pause says. Now I have a generally high view of Matthews Pause. I think he's a, he's you know a, a solid, decent, good man. Um, but the, the the seeds of state capture and corruption and that whole you know the looting state, uh, the mafia state, all of those were sown. Well, not all of those, but a, a, a large chunk of those were were sown during the Mbeki era. When um, on the policy front, you had legislation like NEMA and, and so on that sounds fine, you know, environmental legislation, why would that matter? But it gave huge powers to the administrative state to, to, to man manage the resources. So if you've got a huge administrative state, then you've got officials that you need to appoint to that. Then you get the idea of cater deployment being official ANC policy. So you create a massive administrative state that the, N that the NP was actually trying to slim down towards the final years of apartheid. You recreate an administrative state. You create many, many vacancies. You appoint and deploy your cadres there. And systematically, that almost inevitably warps into corruption uh, and state capture. And the idea of preferential procurement and BEE, these things that are now, you know, throttling the economy, whether it's through labor policy, whether it's through um, uh, scaring off investments like, you know, Starlink can, can, can come here only if they, you know, uh, tithe to the gods of racial uh, nationalism, um, or whether it's the question of ESCOM, and these problems are not new at all. In fact, they emerged during the Mbeki presidency. So while we should welcome Ackerman and the like making a point about this, uh, saying that it isn't sustainable, it is risky, uh, one, one does, you know, the, the question needs to be asked, where have these people been over the last 15 years um, to not take this quite seriously? And I know I'm, I'm sort of scaring everyone over, under, under the same comb here. There have been business leaders that have spoken out. I think APSA around 2007 actually did some really, really good public uh, uh, comment that halted expropriation without compensation way back then, making the point that it would um, vastly damage the asset registers and the asset books. Of, of the banks. But now we're in a situation of what can realistically be done um, within the next year or two years of intense economic pressure with the thought of COVID now biting. I mean, what's it? I always fail, struggle to pronounce this, but Arterol Mittal, Arterol Mittal, or whatever one might say, um, losing such a significant manufacturing and operational and commercial capacity. It it, it 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 sort of it, it's really worrying. It's welcome that these people are speaking up, but where have they been for the last fifteen years? Uh, Morris, any thoughts on this before we move on to the next? Uh, one? Yeah, I'd say a lot of the uh, seeds for this were actually laid even under the Mandela presidency. Uh, remember, the arms deal was under Nelson Mandela. Uh, Bonte Alamisa left the ANC. He was a cabinet minister in the Mandela government, and he reported on corruption of Stella Sikau, I think, who'd been. Uh, Prime Minister of either the Siska or the Klanska, and uh, he was kicked out of the party for um, unveiling the corruption. Not, nothing happened to Stella Sikar, but uh, Bantolomisa was uh, kicked out. Uh, 1997 was when the ANC adapted, adopted the cater deployment policy. Uh, that was obviously also when Thabo Mbeki became president of the ANC, but it was still Mandela was president of the country. The Employment Equity uh, Act was first uh, came into being in 1998. So, I mean, overall, I mean, I think Mandela will, uh, like, he definitely gets. Uh, two thumbs up for me for overall for his presidency, but a lot of the rot and corruption that we saw, uh, the seeds for it or that we see today, it was laid uh, by uh, while Mandela was president. And also let's remember in South Africa, uh, you don't vote for a person, you vote for a party. And Mandela was a member of the ANC and a lot of the problems we had in South Africa today is because of the ANC and 
you know, Nelson Mandela was there was his, his political party. So it's uh, it's, 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 it's also, right. It's also worth mentioning that um, uh, there is still good things to be said even about the Mbeki years, um, even yeah, though you know a lot of these problems you 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 mention really intensified then. But uh, uh, Matthew Spoza is correct at least in identifying kind of the end of the Mbeki presidency as a turning point. And it is, there's a story we're not going to cover today that we were thinking about, which was about the South African passport and how it was at its strongest on the world stage in terms of countries it could get you into without a visa uh, in 2009. And if you look at almost every single indicator of, you know, the development of the country, the economic growth, the fiscus, all turns around basically starting in 2009. Uh, but something that that you should also I, I nick i think it was you who once mentioned to me that's that you know south korea singapore um these these countries that are economically you know quite uh they've, they've got strong economic engines and um they aren't by any means corruption free um yes. i so, so there's this it's, it's sort of a to to use the cynical phrase it's manageable level of corruption um where when the economy was really doing well in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, you know, your 2004, 5, 6, 7, when we saw annual GDP growth north of 3, 4%, then to put it very, very cynically, you can afford a level <laughs> right. of corruption. You can afford that level of, you know, scooping off the top because there's enough going on. There's enough being put out by the system that whatever. When you is have needed, economic growth cripple yes so the Mbeki right. era had that but we shouldn't think that it, it, it's it's a binary choice of either you have a corrupt state and a functioning economy you can, you can have a bit of both you can um and i think that's that's close to what we saw with the Mbeki era and the policy turnaround that led to economic slowdown under zuma mm -hmm. made the corruption worse because as a proportion of what was available to the looter, it just became bigger and bigger and bigger, and the effects were were even more, you know, drastically felt. Exactly. Um, all right, so let's very briefly talk about this last story. The ANC is very concerned about the interest rate hikes from the Reserve Bank, and it's going to, quote, urgently hold discussions with the South African Reserve Bank to explore other measures to manage the current economic challenges other than raising interest rates. It's according to General Secretary of the ANC, Fikile Mbulula. Um, Fikile is very worried about the rising costs of living, uh, the cost of uh, interest rates going up, and the difficulty this causes for people who have uh, borrowed money. Um, he says that the ANC plans to curb the rising cost of living by focusing on economic growth based on expanded domestic production and ending load shedding. Uh, Herman, why didn't anyone think of that before? Yeah, no, um, I'll, I'll make a note of that and I'll just send Gile a WhatsApp saying, thanks, man. If only, if only we thought about economic growth. No, I think it's a bit like um, you're driving a car. You have the handbrake applied you have both the clutch and the brake pedal pressed down you have the aircon on full you've got all the windows open you've got the bonnet open and then you're like hmm we should press down the accelerator harder to move faster the problem that Fakile Mbalula and the ANC has here is that they they have done everything whether deliberately or accidentally, to make economic momentum difficult to gain. Um, and that's the frustrating thing here, is that the, the diagnosis of getting is almost right. I'm, I'm not quite sold on the domestic production front. I mean, there's there's a bit of nuance that we, we should go there. I'm not massively on the means of production argument equals, means of production uh, equals economic success. But if you want to bring down the cost of living in South Africa, you have to stabilize the power grid. You have to improve security um, so that businesses can actually operate functionally and consumers can have their goods protected. You have to be able to get goods to market. You have to be able to gain skills and experience through minimum wage, sub-minimum wage employment as a, 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 a gateway uh, to, to a, a, an upward skills trajectory. So all of these things can make the cost of living pressures less angling for the reserve bank on this is is 
uh, it's like pressing that pedal, that accelerator down and not thinking, yeah. hey, perhaps also, you can ease up on the handbrake. Like, guys, inflation is bad for the cost of living too. Like, <laughs> you know, you know uh, and, and the Reserve Bank's policy has actually been pretty successful in, in, in kind of curbing the outliers of inflation. We haven't had it too bad. Um, it's not been great, but it hasn't been like as terrible as some, you know, developed economies have actually suffered. And um, going off the Reserve Bank is just not good for the uh, business community's confidence in the country. This is exactly the kind of thing that can spook markets into doing something terrible and cause big economic problems. Um, Morris, final thoughts before we close up. Uh, yeah, I think before when you see a lot more of this kind of thing, this kind of populist stuff, we're gonna, I think we're going to see start seeing a lot more stuff that going to nationalize the Reserve Bank because they're doing the wrong thing. We've already seen the ANC. Uh, start talking about there's too many illegal foreigners in South Africa, and we've seen some other populist stuff, NHI and all that. So I'm going to see a lot more of this before the 2024 elections. So a lot of it's just noise, but a lot of it is also stuff to keep an eye on, I think. And like, I wouldn't be too worried about what the ANC is doing the Reserve Bank now, but it's definitely, I think it is a warning sign, and it's, we can't be complacent, I think. Uh, yeah, right. so it's just something to watch. We're going to see a lot more of this kind of rhetoric getting up in the election next year. I agree with that. The, the the political pressures on the ANC to start making, shall we say, short-term decisions um, are going to be very intense. Okay, with that, uh, that's all for today. Uh, we are going to have a show tomorrow, um, and we're going to start doing it on Fridays pretty much regularly. So have a, have a look out for us there. And with that, everyone, I hope you all have a wonderful day and a great, well, not weekend, but great day. Cheers, everyone.